Episodes of the Green Corn Rebellion show are sponsored by Oklahoma Progress Now. Oklahoma Progress Now is a 501c4 organization focused on building progressive power in Oklahoma. Their primary efforts are on developing progressive content for a 21st century audience, coalition, and capacity building across progressive organizations and causes, and working to see elected leaders who are more responsive to their constituents and the needs of the many. Areas of focus include progressive messaging and communications, coalition building and resource sharing, and focused progressive policy goals. You can check out their Twitch live streams, and they go uh, live on Facebook on at noon, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Please support this organization. It's a really great organization. It's just getting started here in Oklahoma. Uh, thank you. Now enjoy the rest of the video. Hello, this is the Green Corn Rebellion Show, and today I am here with Chris Taylor Brown, the lead singer and rhythm guitarist of the band Trapped. Oh. How are you? How are you doing today, sir? Awesome, man. It's just uh, another day in, on house arrest. You know what I'm saying? All right. It's an honor to have one of the uh, guys who was a part of one of my favorite genres of music, or at least Madonna. for a short period of, period of time, you guys were new metal. Yeah. Um, I guess, so, I guess a part of Headstrong would, would be considered that. Yeah. Uh, JJ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, so first question I have here is about the album cover of your first album. It's uh, a guy mowing weird. the lawn. What yes. is what 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 what? How did that end up being the album cover? We uh we couldn't figure out what to do uh, as an album cover. You know, we, we made it our the trap logo. We made that T. It's like it looks like a U with a bar on the top of it, but it's it's really like a negative. Like the bottom's like a negative T. The, the, the part going up and down, and the top part's the top of the top of the T. Um. And yeah, and then my manager just came across this that photo, and he's like, "Doesn't this like feel like suburbia? Like you know where you guys are from? You know, or we we just thought that it kind of like encapsulated that, you know, like Joe Rogan kind of talks about like that trap that people get themselves into, where it's like you know you got to have that white picket fence, you got to have that that job that you may not like, but it brings it brings in the money, and, and then you got your family, and then you kind of just you know, end up in a life that you it was a little bit like semi charmed, you know, not like exactly what you wanted, but because you want you wanted that white picket fence life, that you you know you got yourself into that kind of thing. So I, I've just seen a lot of people like that. You, you know, even now, like friends of mine, you can tell that they're kind of feeling trapped, you know, <laughs> like pun intended. But um, yeah, so it was just kind of like that that thing Joe Rogan talks about, like that's just that that uh suburban you know or i mean i'm sure people in the cities do the same thing but just that kind of rat race kind of you know fit it fit it conforming to society kind of thing you know and we just felt like that picture kind of represented that <laughs> all right um and what was it like being popular during the whole new metal era and what was it like being associated with that genre at the time well, we, uh, I mean, I grew up listening to Korn, and, I, you know, my, the first record I ever bought was, like, Pro, was Pearl Jam when I was 10, and I loved those first two albums, even into the third album, and then, you know, I started listening to the harder stuff, like Deftones, and then Korn, and then Limp Bizkit, and Rage Against the Machine, and, and all that stuff, and then Pop Roach, and then we started the, the band, um, like, you know, the year, year after I first saw Pop Roach at a small club, and, and I was like, that's awesome, and the next year we were open up for a band called Snot. Um, yeah. Singer, rest in peace. You know, it was a, it was a cool, great band. We, they were cool dude to us and everything. But yeah. Um, and then, I, you know, uh, but I also love you too, and Dave Matthews and Fleetwood Mac and, and, and Pink Floyd and all that kind of stuff. So I think that a lot of that fed into our, our music. Like when I was going to UC Santa Barbara, I, I was majoring in mechanical engineering and did my, freshman year and then like halfway through the sophomore year all the label interest you know was was you know uh, high enough where we all felt like we could just drop out of college and, and just really go go move to LA and really do it and then nine months later we got 
got a deal. It was on on 9/11 of all of all days, man. It was a bittersweet day for sure. But um, yeah, that was the day that ended. But and then Lincoln Park had just came out like right around the time when we when we got sent we were signed, you know, like right before that. And uh, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, you know, it was Papa Roach and then Lincoln Park and then Trap. And I guess we yeah we were like the tail end of that. But I mean. I just, I don't really, I think when I think of new metal, I think of like rap metal, like, like hip hop kind of beats and bob, bob your head kind of, kind of stuff, you know, and then like, you know, the metal singing, but sing, metal vocalists, but more singing, I don't know, more hooks and, and all that stuff. I feel like metal is a very technical genre um, and not so much like uh, a beat and a hook, you know, it's more, it's, it's just a lot more technicality going on and um uh, yeah and it's like hip hop is not technical you know no one nobody thinks nobody thinks of like a progressive technical hip hop group you know it's just you know bob your head and, and it's it's primarily about the vocals you know so i think that's kind of like new metal was that idea but but with metal you know a little little heavier kind of thing like that so but i, I just i mean tra- i mean like a song called echo from our first record or stories or, or so many songs in that of these walls it's like not even close to new metal you know yeah it's just a <clears throat> just a rock song you know sometimes some songs are love love song rock songs some like these walls are are uh, <clears throat> you know just a rock song you know straight up and straight up and down maybe still frame has got that bob to it and that you can jump you know, hop, hop up and down to it but and then we've had some other songs that are, are heavier but I don't, I don't know i just don't look look at it as like the corn like you know that 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 head bob thing yeah you know, we don't really don't really do that as much it's more melodic you know rock rock music you know to me all right uh and third question i have here which you might have kind of answered that who are some of your biggest musical influences yeah definitely i you know just uh from 10 to 19 or 20 it was it was all those bands i'd mentioned you know um just the, the heavier stuff and then started getting more into just songs, you know, to really like for me, acoustic guitar wise, um, the biggest influence on me was Dave Matthews. Cause he just plays awesome chords. Um, I don't think he gets enough credit for being just a, a really, uh, awesome guitar player, awesome acoustic guitar player who comes up with really cool riffs. You know, at least the first three albums he had are, are you know, so fun to play and then, and, and sing to it. You know, you got to really, it's a, it's a challenging thing, and it makes you a lot better player. If, you know, you, you put the time in to try to try to be able to do those songs. And, uh, that definitely helped me write, be a songwriter and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, all those different different uh, styles of music I feel like are just a little like just a bunch of colors on your palette, and then you can paint with all that. And so that's all your influences, you know. All right. Well, those are some of the questions I've had in my head for years uh ever since i've ever listened to trapped so now we're going to get into the debate portion of this episode of the green corn rebellion show uh interesting enough i never assumed when starting the show that i would be having a, a singer of a band i like on to debate them with politics <laughs> but here we are i love it um, yeah, we gotta do it so, um, as people know, you're a very vocal Trump supporter. Yeah. Um, I assume you're a Republican as well. Yeah, uh, definitely always have. You're, yeah, you're, you're someone who is on the right. I'm a prominent Bernie supporter. I guess I'm prominent for a thousand yeah. Twitter followers. But uh, <laughs> yeah. um, I'm a socialist. I'm a leftist. So... Five things I got here that we're going to go back and forth with a little bit. Uh, I have health care or single-payer health care, uh, yep. $15 minimum wage, free college tuition, white privilege slash criminal justice reform, because I feel like those kind two things kind of go together, and yep. trade deals. So single-payer health care, Medicare for all, uh, how do you feel about health care? what we should do, uh, how do you feel yeah. about Medicare for all, go well, on. Yeah. The, the people you just have to look at simple economics when, when thinking of anything, and that's supply 
and demand. So over the last, you know, 50, 60 years, we have increased demand by putting more people on, you know, Medicare or Medicaid, let me say. Um, we've added more people doing that. And also with the big employer uh, provided, uh, that's the more that went up, the employers could write off uh, their employees' health the expenses, you know, that what they have to pay on their on their employees' behalf. The more they can write that off, the more that people jump into those health healthcare plans. So it's just the increased uh, demand uh, with government policy, but they did not increase the supply. So since the 1920s, you had the American Medical Association have doing everything they can to make it harder for the next doctor to get his license. And for, for obvious reasons, a lot of industries do that. You know, it's like, it, it, I don't think it's very moral, but, you know, it's, they, they protect their, their income-producing ability. To, the, the less, you know, supply of doctors, the more each doctor in the system is going to make. So all the hospitals and the doctors, uh, American Medical Association, they collude together to make sure that um, supply doesn't go up. And then, you know, it's, it's so hard to build a new hospital. Like if uh, some billionaire is like, hey, I want to I give back. I want to help increase the supply of health care, of available uh, hospitals and doctors. And to, to build a new hospital, you have to go through so many hoops. And you should just be able to donate a hospital if you want to. If you have, if you've got billions of dollars, build the hospital and and put the money up for the doctors and all that stuff, and try to build some build more hospitals. That's what we should do. We should build more hospitals, more rural hospitals, just increase the supply. So that's what I would say is to bring the price down. If you're going to have so many people in the, in the healthcare system, you're going to add to the demand. You've got to increase the supply, and that's just that goes goes for anything you know but the thing is you've got people who i mean i don't want to say they're corrupt or anything but actively doing what they can to to lobby the government to pass certain laws to make it harder to build hospitals and make it harder to get credentials to be a doctor you know we should be able to ha there should be urgent care urgent care clinics being run by nurse practitioners way more there should that should quadruple if, if not be 10 times what it is now so that, that you know so that at least there's you know uh, you break your leg or you need stitches or you know you need a prescription for this or that like the nurse protection nurse practitioner can take care of that stuff and doctors would hate that they let they just they would make less money if that was the case but that's what i would do i would use a market-based solution um so that uh there's always a – that's the capitalist in me. There's always an incentive to work hard and, you know, get promoted and, you know, make more money. But not using the government to protect your ability to make money by just making it so there's less doctors. That's just – that's – that goes against innovation. That goes against capitalism. That's using the government's policies to make yourself more money. And that that's not capitalism. That's mercantilism. That's, you know, America is not a, a full uh, – yeah. All, right. All right. Now, what were you? Last thing I heard was that's not capitalism. Yeah, I was saying that um, lobby having an American Medical Association lob, is a lobbyist group. Having lobbyists um, lobby the government <clears throat> to use um, policy uh, to aid one group of people against another. Yeah. So they're aiding a group that's established. Um, against a group that has not established themselves yet, and that is not capitalism. That's mercantilism, and it's, and it's what's wrong with our government. Um, so yeah, like I said, I would, I would uh, make new, or making it so that you're making new hospitals and new urgent care centers, and who can run those urgent care uh, facilities, like nurse practitioners, instead of having to have a doctor's license, that would significant, significantly drop the prices of healthcare, I think. So like I said, whatever you got to do as a government to increase the supply of healthcare to meet the demand so that prices don't keep going up and up and up. Because 
we have this big baby boomer generation and they, you know when they started social security in the 30s or whatever it was a seven to workers to one retiree now it's two workers for every one retiree and it's getting worse over the next 15 20 years so you know that's this that's that's a big reason why healthcare costs are going up too is there's, a, there's a, an aging a large part portion of our country that's aging and needs health care so you got to increase the supply um and that would be the case even if you had universal health care you know you would the you're still going to have prices for you. You got to you got to reduce the price of doctor visits. You've got to reduce the price of, of surgeries of, of, of the, across the board. You got to, and that, the way you do that is to increase the supply. So um, it doesn't matter if everyone's on the same healthcare plan or if it's all these different healthcare plans. You still got to increase the supply. That's not going to that problem's not going to go away. So, the universe, I mean, I just wouldn't do universal health care because I don't believe that the government runs things very well. That's correct. You know, you look at the US, the United the U.S. Postal Service and it's it loses lots of money every year. And like Venezuela is a country that has like 660 state run companies and over 70 percent of them lose money every year. And that's because no one has an incentive to work hard to keep their jobs, their jobs are, are just safe and until the whole thing collapses, like what's going on over there. So I've, I've studied that, you know, what happens with socialism uh, for many years, you know, de decades now. Uh, so uh, I know what the dangers of collectivism are and, and central planning from one big central government is planning the entire economy. That's why the United States does so well because we have a very diverse economy where there's so many different people making money in so many different ways because they have the freedom to do that. So if you have a USSR type socialism where, you know, you test out of high school and they go, oh, you should be a chemical engineer and you should be a civil engineer and you should be this and that. It's the, the freedom is just not there. Whereas in the United States, you have all the freedom in the world to, to you know, be a dominatrix if you want to make money that way. You can make money in any way you want, pretty much, in the United States, and it's not so much the case in uh, some a lot of socialist countries. So, um, yeah, so that's what I'd say about, I, I definitely would keep the system we have, um, healthcare-wise, I, I, I would allow anyone, even if, you know, so if it's like if there's a healthcare provider in, or a health insurance company in Las Vegas, if they want to cover people in Massachusetts, that should be okay. You know, I don't know. And that's just another protect, you know, my guy, protect my insurers over yours. It's like that they should be able to cross straight lines and, and offer insurance plans. And, and, and then, and there should also not be one size fits all insurance plans. They should, you know, if you're, if you don't, if you have a certain pre existing condition that you think you can manage without, Healthcare because it costs so much damn money. You should be able to carve that out of your healthcare plan. It, you should be able to make whatever healthcare plan you want to make with a health insurance provider. So if you know if you just want to do catastrophic, like somebody hits you and and you got to take an ambulance, you break your arm or something. Like that's all you care about. You're, like you're going to handle cancer and di diabetes and heart you know disease on your own by trying to be as healthy and eat as healthy as you can. And you think you can do that? And you know who's to say you can't? Right now, you can't. You know, with Obamacare, it's a it's very much one size fits all plans that include everything. You can't just all a car. Oh, I'll do that and I'll do that and I'll do that and I don't care if you don't want to cover this and this and this or that and that and that. So, like I said, there should be more freedom in in how health insurers can insure you, and there should be a ton more a supply of avail available health care more urgent care, urgent care clinics, more hospitals, and make it easier and, and loosen the regulations on that kind of stuff. So I wouldn't go uh, just a one. I would never do, want to do it to get rid of all the private insurers. I don't think that the 150 million Americans who are on a employer-based health care plan will ever go for that. You know, ditch that for um, a universal health care plan, especially with the way – 
everybody knows Americans aren't eating very well, you know? A lot of people eating fast food, a lot of people eating real bad stuff, and diabetes is one of the biggest problems, you know, high, high cardiovascular problems, all that kind of stuff, because of what people are eating. They're just not eating very well. So, and there's some people who probably go out of their way to eat better, and, you know, those people aren't going to want to be on the same healthcare plan as somebody who's eating very badly, you know? So that's what my position on all that. Okay. So... I am, I'm not going to argue necessarily in favor of Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill because I see a lot of flaws in it, but I am going to argue more in favor of kind of like the NHS system in the UK, wherein, you know, you have, you know, they're able to build hospitals, the government is, and also the doctors are technically employees of the state. So we're the nurses, stuff like that. Kind of like VA, so, right? It's like, kind it's like of, a VA. Kind of, but more efficient and more positive results, more well-funded, unless you're talking about in recent years. But even then, yeah. most people in the UK are going to vote to get rid of the NHS. They but no, love it. But, they love yeah. it. So. So, well, so I think that the problem, well, you, you said earlier, you know, the AMA, they lobby against... Um, you know, against people basically being yeah. able to be properly insured. You know, they're against single payer as well. Yeah. Um, so I do think that that is definitely a problem. Lobbying for certain industries is definitely a problem. But I don't believe that it should be the free market that decides how healthcare is necessarily handled. I think the free market should be taken out of the conversation. The government should fund the hospitals and everyone's care. Therefore, everyone's able to get it. Uh, You mentioned earlier about how some people, uh, they don't necessarily have very many health problems. The reason why that may be is because they are able to go see a doctor to stop certain things from being able to happen. Mm -hmm. But here in America, we have a system where People don't have the ability to be able to go for a doctor or go see a doctor once a year, once every two years to check up on themselves, to be able to have that preventative talk about how their health is going. So under a single payer system, everyone would be able to do that. Therefore, you would be able to have a healthier populace and you would have less of those situations where you become so unhealthy and the next thing you know, you have a heart attack or you have A, B, and C happen and then you have this big bill. But even if that does happen to you where that happens, like a heart attack or something of that nature, you still have that covered under a single pair system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as we all know, people that have, uh, countries that have single pair healthcare systems, they tend to be more healthier on average than people here. They have higher life expectancies. That's the reason why is because people are able to go to the doctor and be able to have the info to be able to know what's going on with their bodies and be able to stay healthy uh, before those things happen. Um, Another thing is uh, you mentioned the hospitals, the rural hospitals. Currently, right now, the reason why some of the hospitals, especially here in Oklahoma, have closed is because uh, people are uninsured and aren't able to go to these hospitals in order for the money to go through to these hospitals. Under single payer system, the hospitals will be able to stay open regardless of how many people are able to go to them or not because you know the hospitals tend to be in the more urban areas where there's people but in the ur- rural areas where there's less people those hospitals have closed because there's less economic development therefore less people are going to be there and some of those people are going to be less insured so therefore it's a combination of both things if the government were to fund that hospital that <clears throat> these hospitals they would just stay open and therefore during a pandemic where we have you know, places that are probably going to be filled up with hospital beds and whatnot. Their hospital beds are going to be filled up. We would be able to build those hospitals and add on to them. And we would also just have those hospitals there. Um, 
in case that <clears throat> a pandemic happens. Um, so that's kind of my argument with that, um, is that we would be a healthier society if we all just had health care. The freedom issue, oh, and you also mentioned employer health care insurance. Many people are losing their jobs right now. What is it, like almost 10 million people have yeah, lost their jobs? Uh, uh, it's, it's about 20 million. It's 20 million. On its yeah, so, 30. And it's, it's, all, it's all across the board, too. It's not even, it's not just in, in uh, you know, uh, restaurants and bars and entertainment mm-hmm. and stuff like that. It's yeah. like big time. And the people who were like, oh, I can just work from home, I guess now they're getting laid off. So, But yeah, so, but like some, but those, some of those people, they're losing their health care right now because they've also lost their job. Under a single payer healthcare system, they wouldn't have to lose their health care yeah. whenever they lose their job. I so, think we should. We're, well, the big test, I think, of all healthcare systems are is going on as we speak. Uh, you know, you look at Italy, and they haven't made a good case for themselves on how good their healthcare system is. I mean, the the death rate over there is, was like 11, 12 percent. The UK's death rate is double digits as well. And our ours is two is about three percent right now across the board, and I would think I I know there's more tests, I mean there's more people there's more cases probably that people have because a lot of it is asymptomatic or very mild, like eighty percent that they say, but it just it's it's it, the United States has the best best healthcare system if you can access it, so that 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 will leave a, a good amount of people who don't have access to it so that's it's almost like <clears throat> like a trade-off of the top 70 80 percent having great health care is for the bottom 20 percent to have nothing and it's like a lot of you see that a lot in in the united states where it's like you know 15 to 20 percent of the population really needs a lot of help um getting getting helping to make ends meet and all that kind of stuff it's like uh you know you're always going to have that percentage of population where you, you got to help them out. And that's, that's why we have welfare and that's why we have food stamps and the things that we have. Um, it's just the, I think when you, it's, when you have 330 million people and you border what is a third world kind of pretty much a third world country in Mexico. Um, my mother's side came from there from Southern Mexico in the fifties. Um, you know, and, and their healthcare system is not, not very good, you know, um, not great. But it's, I mean, I, is it a, is it a universal healthcare system in Mexico? I believe so. But, you know, it's not, it's just not great. Um, so people come to the United States to get stuff. But then, you know, you hear about people in the United States going into Mexico, and there's a lot of horror stories. Uh, when you think about surgeries and this and that, I've just, I've heard a lot of, of horror stories with people going over to Mexico to get stuff done cheaper. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But uh, another, you talked about another problem you, you know, with our system. Yeah. yeah. And you talked about uh, the issue of access. We have the best healthcare system if you're able to access it. Yes. Well, the access part is the money. When people don't have the money, they don't have the access. But in countries where they have a single payer system, if you don't have the money out of pocket, you still have access. What, so if, what do you think is going to happen yeah, to, so like in, in Beverly Hills, uh, I, I, was live, I lived there from like 2012 to 20, 2015 or so, mm-hmm. and yeah, all the gastroenterologists, the, the ear, nose, and throat doctors, just all the specialists, they didn't even take insurance at all. I mean, I, I did, they would only, they would just say, I'm not going to take insurance. They, they, you just paid them straight up, and they were the, the most richest you know, uh, doctors in the world, pretty much in Beverly Hills, and so mm-hmm. it's like when you have a universal healthcare system, the government's going to tell you, you you did all this schooling and all this stuff, you, and going to tell you how much you should make, um, which you know what it, that you might make that much if if they would stop if the AMA would stop uh, you know uh, favoring current doctors over doctors who want to become doctors, you know, maybe those those doctors who are making all that money would not be able to command such higher rates if there were plenty more doctors and more supply of doctors and the government did what they could to to increase that kind of 
that, those kind of uh, doctors and all that, that kind of care. So, but um, I just think that's that's the thing. It's if, if you are a provider of healthcare, um, you're gonna if you if you do the health the universal healthcare system, you're gonna have to do what they say. You're gonna have mm-hmm. to do what your employer, which is what would be the government, says. So it's like kind of that USSR forcing people to do this job for that much money. And that's well, that's what a lot of people don't like about socialism is the is forcing uh, people to um, you know do what the government says and the job that the government says you should do and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's the day, that's what a lot of doctors that I know would be afraid of that they wouldn't be able to set their own rates and the, and and all that kind of stuff. And even right now, a lot of doctors don't want to take Medicaid. A lot of them don't even want to take Medicare because they they're reimbursed very late and then the the medicare and medicaid say no we're not going to pay any more than this for that procedure and that doctor's like well you know you're telling me what i can you know charge for my business you know and so that's what that's what a lot of americans uh don't want that to happen in their industries if even if it's not has anything to do with healthcare, they wouldn't want anyone to tell you tell them this is how you need to do it and this is how much you're allowed to charge and no more than that um <clears throat> which is what they do in venezuela you know like like I said, 660. Well, uh, well, under, well, in under in the UK and with the NHS, the doctors they get paid monthly, so it's not like you're going to be worrying about where your money's coming from. Doctors uh, in countries with single payer healthcare, they're not starving or anything. They're still able to live decent yeah. lives. A lot, they're a lot and smaller it, than, also, yeah. but also uh with you know like some j- certain jobs you do get incentives you, they do get bonuses for how well they do like i know if some am- amount of their um some of their patients if they quit smoking they get a bonus for that if they um you know if they have a certain amount of you know Things like that, they end up getting bonuses for them. So it's not like there's no um, incentive structure to do better or no, um, you know, it's just not you being able to uh, tell people how much they're going to have to pay for X, Y, Z. So it's more beneficial that way because then more people will have access to what they need as opposed to people having to you know, have the price tag, but not be able to pay for the care that they need. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I, the, the, the thing to me is like, uh, like I said, 330 million people in the United States, 60 million people in the UK. So yeah, it's just, it's a lot easier to run a big healthcare system like that with 60 million versus seven times that, uh, you know, um, we also so have more money than six and a half times that. But we also have more money than them. Like we're the wealthiest country, so we would be able to have more money to put more resources in schooling. Uh, we'd be able to have more resources to hire people. So there would be more. We'd be able to incentivize more people to be able to become doctors and to be able to stay in that profession. And we probably, if we funded it correctly, would be able to have a better healthcare run healthcare system than they do. Have you looked into the amount of private health insurance that are that is offered in the UK? The amount of it mm-hmm. is probably very little. It's probably for supplemental. Yeah, they it's supplemental for you know brain you know like there's certain things the NHS won't cover, and that's where these private insurers come in, come into play. So I you know it we I think in the United States if we could there should be like a public option that is, you know, at least the stuff where it's like if you get hit by a car, if you break your arm, you know, the stuff that's not like uh, dependent on like the food you eat and like the the lifestyle you're living and all that kind of stuff, which is you know contributes to diabetes and cancer and heart disease and all that kind of stuff. There's sometimes you just you just get into an accident or you you know you take a fall and you break something or whatever. And, and then you're like, you, you know, you hit with 60, a $60,000 bill because you just broke your arm and, and, or you, you're 
arm got out of its socket and they had to pop it back in and they, it in the ambulance triad and that whole day cost you 50 grand and you have to declare bankruptcy like that that kind of stuff i think at, you know i think it, i think uh democrats you know the liberals are very smart that they, they would introduce um like a smaller or more of a bare bones uh government plan and then and then there's the private insurance for for the the, ma the major stuff or, or stuff that you feel like if you eat better or if you you know there's certain ways to prevent your cancer and you know there's i'm really big into epigenetics which is you know the you know um your mental state controls controls the the amount of inflammatory responses you have in your body you know so if you're angry all the time if you're um you know mad at the world or if you're you know upset and you're depressed or you're 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 not listening to yourself and the kind of life you want to live and you're just upset about that that you're going to die sooner from that you're going to have more adrenaline flowing through your body more upregulation of your you know parasympathetic your sympathetic nervous system you know and and you'll you'll get health problems from that so there's i'm, I'm big into that I'm big into you know trying to eat as good as i can especially especially hard from the road i tell you you know you, you try to do the whole foods thing and eat right and everything and then you know you're on tour and it's like you got mcdonald's on one side and you got wendy's on the other side and it's like you know but, but a lot of americans that's all they eat you know so yeah it's like you know it, it would be when we have this big pharma uh you know i know socialists uh, you know and and, and liberals uh, progressives have to they have to hate big pharma you know it's like let's let's sicken people with chemicals and crap food and just uh, a ton of refined carbohydrates like you walk into any any uh supermarket it's like high fructose corn syrup that high fructose corn syrup this you know it's it's a lot of crap and that stuff you know puts visceral fat on people and that releases endotoxins that attach to cholesterol and and then that cholesterol can't go back to the liver and get processed so it sticks on the side of the wall and then you start getting heart problems so there's so many problems that the food industry and you know with chemicals that make make it so food lasts longer all that stuff but that that severely impacts uh, americans health where europe doesn't have the, as much of a problem with that because they've passed laws and and done what they needed to do to make sure that uh, those unhealthy foods aren't really aren't hurting their people so it's crazy that the double pronged attack on americans which is like the horrible food and all the chemicals and you know, all this stuff and there's no you know that there's an industry that's just trying to profit off off healthcare like as high as they can so i think you know as long as everyone keeps talking about it and um i think that americans can at least start with hey if you break your arm or you need some like an urgent care thing that there should be like an like a kaiser kind of thing that's run by the government but it's just urgent care clinics i think that st stuff like that should be talked about where there can at least be um, compromises between capital, the capitalist, you know, kind of free market approach, and then, you know, the more socialism driven, you know, VA type approach, uh, some kind of hybrid in the middle there, which is compromise. You know, I mean, that's all you can do in in, uh, in politics is compromise. No one's ever going to get everything they want. I don't think. You know? All right. Well, I feel like we spent a lot on that. Um, Let's go into the minimum wage. So how do you feel about the minimum wage? How do you feel about $15 minimum wage? How do you feel about the current minimum wage? What do you think we should do with that? Um, well, I, I have, you know, I think that uh, the more people you have inside your country that um, are willing to work for much less than minimum wage because they're not even supposed to be here they're not even here legally, um, you know, they, there's people undercutting, uh, uh, undercutting other people on their wedges to, to a degree in that realm. Um, and then other than that, I think that, you know, I, 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 I think that if you had, um, if you didn't have welfare issues where, you know, somebody makes 20,000 a year in a part-time job um, or a really low hourly 
wage job and has a few kids, they're going to get about forty thousand dollars in food stamps and in Medicaid, uh, in housing assistance, housing vouchers. You name it. They're, it's as if they're going to be making sixty thousand a year uh, with forty thousand in government services and then their twenty thousand dollars they make. Um, but the second they make. 38,000, then they lose it all. Or the second, they make 32,000. There's just this cutoff where and you get nothing after that. So it incentivizes you to not demand higher wages. Not, you know, you, you know it's like if, if the government took away some of that stuff, then people would just demand from Amazon or demand from Walmart more money or they wouldn't be able to live. So we subsidize Walmart and and Amazon and those big companies, we basically make it so they don't have to pay their workers as much because because our government's taking care of them. And it's like you're you so you would penalize people for making more money by taking away uh, a lot of services if they get to this one point. You know, it's it should be stuff should be phased out over the more money that you make. It's this these stupid cutoffs that I don't understand. You know, it's like you you make one thousand dollars more that year, you lose Medicaid, you lose the food stamps you lose this and that and it's and you lose a lot more than that thousand that extra whatever ten thousand you just put on your you, know, you made that year even though you worked harder you worked more hours you tried to get a raise and, you know all this stuff you're actually penalized for that so that that's that's got to be looked at and figured out but the problem with the 15 dollar minimum wage stuff stuff is that it will hit certain different industries disproportionately so the restaurant industry you know, if, if, a, if a restaurant makes X amount per month, then they only can spend X amount on on employees. So if, you, if, if you've got 20 employees making $8 an hour, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, you know Los Angeles or Seattle says, oh, now you got to pay $15 an hour, you've got to fire pretty much half your staff. There's just no other way you, to look at it. You know, it's ma- like clothing industry, retail industry, it's the same idea. So I think that if you're talking about minimum wage, fifteen dollar minimum wage stuff, you can't just have a be a blanket thing. It's like companies earning X amount or this big should pay that minimum wage. And then if you're smaller companies, smaller businesses, you don't have to pay that minimum wage. So it shouldn't be a blanket, all one size fits all thing. It should, I think that uh, there there should be minimum wage stuff that it's different for different sized companies. Which is what okay. we don't have that right now. You know? Okay, so I pretty much agree with you about the welfare aspect of it because yeah. you know these people aren't really making. I mean, if you're making eight dollars an hour, even working full time, on top of that, some of these places like McDonald's, uh, they don't even give you full forty hours a week most of the time. They only give you like thirty-five. You're not di- you're not making very much to begin with. And then on top of that, if you're able to get a raise, but it's like $2 or something like that, then you end up losing all whatever welfare benefits you got. That's, yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, but as far as raise, the minimum wage, I agree that it shouldn't be, let's see here, there should be a I feel like there should be a federal minimum wage, but I also think that at the same time, in some states, it shouldn't be that minimum wage because, like, as we know, like, I mean, if you look at any studies, like, a $15 minimum wage might be fine for here in Oklahoma, but in California, it might need to be higher. Or, so, like, so I feel like in some states, it might need to be different. But as far as different companies, and I also feel like it should be phased in, like, you know, over a course of like a few years or something like that, not automatic. But if you're like a smaller business, like a small restaurant, I don't think that you're going to be as hurt by a $15 minimum wage if it were to be raised. Because if you're a smaller business, places like Walmart or McDonald's that it can definitely afford to pay their workers more wages, higher wages, because they're making more money. Those people are going to be able to spend more money 
at these smaller businesses in their local economies. So for those places are going to be making more money uh, already because other p- the workers are getting paid more. So therefore, yeah, yeah, they're going to be able to pay their workers more. Those that's why I have, d- to, have to increase their prices for, for their food. You know, that, they're not going to have to increase yeah. it by that much, though. Like they'll, they, they'll have to they, increase it by exactly in proportional to how much more labor costs that, that are on their books. So if their we'll, labor costs we, go up fifty percent, then they gotta they gotta they pay we'll for that to, somewhere. Yeah, but if they do, it's not like they're gonna be like du- if, just because they double the wages uh, at McDonald's, they're not gonna double the price of a Big Mac. It's all gonna go up a little bit because the estimation is is that more people are gonna be purchasing more. So therefore. So in order to make up the profit that they're losing, they're only have to raise the price not that much more. Yeah, like that's twenty five cents look, more. That, that's, the argument, be a that's the same argument with the trade deal stuff. It's like, you know, oh, you know, it's gonna it costs more to manufacture stuff in America. Sure, yeah, um, but there's that many more jobs in America where people are making thirty bucks an hour or whatever. It's not the entire job is now shipped over to China. Now no one's making that money in America. So, yeah. yeah, Americans might have to pay more money if we manufacture stuff in America, but more people will have money and more, you know. And, and so, yeah, I think there that's a good argument. It's that, that if more people are making more money, they're going to put more money back into the system, which will support higher prices and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, but, but what I'm saying is that, you know, if you're getting – the perfect examples are Seattle, Los Angeles. Um, you know, they're not, they are they are already doing the fifteen dollars stuff, and I think they're phasing it in over the course of years, like you're saying. So they're going to be the 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 study. You know, they're going to be the guinea pigs. Uh, well, so uh, far LA, in Seattle. Seattle, well, so far in Seattle, they say that the employ employment hasn't really changed very much. Or at least, you know, they've probably changed now because of the pandemic, but. Yeah. Uh, they passed it, I want to say, in 2014, and they did a study, I believe, in like 2017 or 2018, and employment hadn't really changed very much. Yeah. So that's one place where you can look at and say, like, okay, employment hasn't really changed very much. I mean, sure, there might be an indiv- one business that might have had to fire someone, but overall, employment didn't drop in, yeah. you know they didn't end up being that much of a problem with that but yeah uh so it looks like we might actually not disagree that much on this nah, i think we're i mean they i i definitely think that um um a walmart the big box retailers can go to 15 and and i think i i think that we should we should leave that stuff to the states you know like you said you know oklahoma might be able to keep it at eight bucks but california can't they got to be at 15 so uh, or New York City or, you know, all that stuff. So I think that's kind of like let's let the states decide um, what they want to do on that, which is kind of what's going, which is what's going on. And that's why the federal government hasn't been, lo- you know, pushed that hard to do anything about their 780 or eight bucks, whatever it is, because no one's really complaining that much because states themselves can just, you know, if, if people in that given state are real, real hungry for that $15 minimum wage law. It'll it'll happen, you know, as we as we're seeing. Even in certain cities, they're doing that, you know. Like if you wanna if you wanna be a business in the city, you gotta pay this much per hour. You know? mm-hmm. That seems to so, be in Seattle, you know, LA. So, so the reason why I don't say I don't disagree that states should or shouldn't be able to handle it, but the reason why I think the govern the national government should at least set it you know, as least at 15 nationally is because like here in Oklahoma, our government, the Republicans, they passed a law back in 2012 or 2014, somewhere in there, that our localities couldn't cha- raise the minimum wage by themselves. It, huh. That like So therefore, if we wanted to do that, that would have to be done by a state petition, which no one's funded the money to be able to get those signatures to get that on the ballot here. Yeah. So that's why I feel like it should be at least the government's decision to raise the bar, and then other states should decide whether or not they can raise it higher than that. Because yeah. I've read studies where pretty much 
and this might be an old, this is an older study that I'm citing because it was like a HuffPo piece from like 2017. Like in Oklahoma, they said if you're going to rent a two bedroom apartment and, you know, be able to live in Oklahoma, it needs to be like $14.95. But I think in some states it might have been 13 something in some other states. This is why I say like it should at least be 15 across the board because in california you probably need like almost 25 bucks an hour what the percentage of americans who already make over 15 bucks an hour and just don't care because they already make over yeah that's the other thing because i think because that's why some people they like some candidates that i talk to here in oklahoma they'll i'll ask them how they feel about the minimum wage and they'll tell me well i think it should be at least maybe raised to 10 or 11 at the state level but i'm like okay but uh when i worked at mcdonald's i got 825 and some people got 860 uh at ross in my hometown it's already 11 dollars an hour you're not really raising the bar that much whenever you're just doing that so therefore you might need to do it a little bit higher but yeah so that's well i guess we've spent enough time on that one uh so College tuition. Um, I'm in support of free college tuition. I believe that college should be free, at least public colleges more specifically, should be tuition free for all students of all ages, races, economic backgrounds to be able to go as long as you make the eligible requirements to be able to apply and get in. Uh, I don't think that people should be taking out student loans in order to go to college and end up in debt. I don't believe that people should be paying so much out of pocket in order to go to college. Yeah. That's my position on that. What is yours? Um, oh, yeah. So my position on that is um, so there's you got the humanities and then you got the STEM stuff, right? You got the what? Say that again. You got the humanities, which is like the liberal arts, the, the gender studies, women's studies, uh, Social, history, sociology, history, yeah. all that stuff. Then you have the STEM fields, you know, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So um, certain degrees are more more valuable than others. So that's why they in the school. But the, the crazy thing is, um, you can get a degree in the liberal arts or humanities, and you and that degree costs the same amount as that STEM degree. But the STEM degree is much more lucrative over the course of the next 40 years. So I think the government should look at this and and give a lot more grants it, it, to the STEM side of it, just because it's a better investment. If you just look at the numbers, we're just looking at capitalistic investment in my country. Um, I think that no one who can get a STEM degree, who can pass those classes, who's got the intelligence to get through that should should worry about having to pay for it because um, the government can step in there and they'll get their money back at times a hundred, you know, th- that investment in that step, you know, in, in giving that kid a, a degree in the STEM fields, it's going to come back to the government tenfold or, or way more. You know what I mean? It's going to be a great investment. Can't say that too too much with the sociology or the communications or the history or you know I, I just see too many people that are, that I know who are in debt and they they are still working at Starbucks because their degree just isn't something that is in demand so um, and and then unfortunately you know this this everyone should go to college thing you know it it, it worked that works for some it it doesn't work for others but um, you know, you can do trade schools um, or you can find a way of making money like I did with music. Uh, there's so, like I said, there's so, such a vibrant economy that you can, there's so many different things you can do. But so I'm kind of like hybrid on that. I'm like, I think we should definitely make sure that the STEM people who are going to pay a lot of taxes over the few, over the next 20, 30, 40 years, um, there should be a lot more grants available to those people and parents of those people and that's a no-brainer to me that's just like that makes sense for just investing in your workforce you're gonna it's gonna come back to you as a taxpayer so it's gonna be it's a it's a risk-free proposition 
you're not throwing money away. You're, you know, the, the person's going to use that degree and they're going to get a good job and they're going to pay a good amount of taxes and they're going to contribute to the, the economy. So it's just a great investment. So the, but the other side of the coin is, is, you know, the other degrees that are not so much lucrative and, you know, the, the, the typical, like we're, we're having a very civil conversation, but I've, I've had some liberals, overly emotional humanities liberals, uh, especially who, <laughs> the ones who are, are in college right now, who are just, they, they want to rip your head off the second you say anything that their college professor uh, didn't teach them or brainwash them, in my opinion, with. So the humanities side, um, it's like, it, it, it's this echo chamber, and a lot of conservatives have an issue at, at colleges. They're not allowed to speak, and they're not allowed to hang out in, this, in the, the common areas because that should be for, you know, I don't know, whatever. That, there's just a lot of uh, I think what I think a lot of those kids, their you know, kids, their parents didn't pay enough attention to them. They were in too much daycare, all you know, from four years old until whatever, and. And they're sensitive and they've been coddled and they get in this world and they, they think that that um, it's like to hear someone else's opinion and 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 to challenge their ego and the way they look at the world. It, it, it's like hurtful to them. And that's just immature and ridiculous. But I think people go in there and try to get a, a, a econo economics or an engineering or science degree. They just they're just trying to get through those grueling classes. I mean, I know. You know, when I was doing mechanical engineering, you know, I got through my calculus. I was on the thermodynamics and, and vector, vector calculus, then thermodynamics, um, and then I dropped out. But that stuff was tough. I mean, that was hard. You know, real. Yeah, you, know, you had to really study. And, and I was writing songs, and I wanted I was writing. You know, doing demos with Jim Wirt, who did the science, like Incubus Science record, and. Um, and so it was, my head was like, it was hard to concentrate on that stuff when, when labels were hitting, hitting us up and we were writing some, you know, really good songs and all that stuff. But uh, it is a tough, uh, the STEM fields are tough you know, to get through. So I would hate for anybody who's, who's going, who would easily pass those classes and they've got the IQ level and all that stuff to get through that. I would hate for any of those people not to get to do that because of money problems because their parents don't have the money or, or they, the parents make a hundred, they make just a little too much for them to qualify. That would suck. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I just think it, it, to, to just have people testing into STEM colleges, colleges that offer those STEM majors, just, if you test in, you just get in government, you know, but then it's like the same thing with education. It's like they do the same thing. The American medical association wants to do the same thing that doctors want to do. It's like every freaking institution in our our uh, country wants to protect their money you know make themselves more money and and have charge more per credit and, and it's like just a big you know even even these colleges that are talking about equality and and all this stuff they want they want it, it to cost 200 grand to go to their college you know and it's just it's insane it's <laughs> 200,000 it's almost like you're paying for a, a diploma and net a net and an ability to network, you know, like you go to Harvard, that's the, you got a great network that you're, you're that's more valuable than the school, than the education you even receive. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So, but I, okay. I this, so, yeah. <laughs> so with that, like, okay. So I get what you're saying about STEM and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, but the people who, a lot of the people who get these liberal arts and humanities degrees, a lot of these people go into teaching, mm -hmm. so that's of that's definitely of value, and I would argue at least as much of value as um, you, you can know add that into the STEM who, you know, teaching. Yeah, yeah, because I, some people who get STEM degrees also go into teaching too. Do but, S T T E M, two T's. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, but uh, but uh, the way I see it is is that. These the people who get these history because I'm a history education major. I'm going to teach high school and middle school kids. That's awesome. Like that's a valuable job, but I think I'm so. going into yeah. I'm going into a field where I'm not going to be making a lot of money, especially in the first several years that I'll be teaching. And if hypothetically someone like me who goes to school 
and then comes up with a lot of student loans. And I know several other teachers who have done this. They're not going to be able to pay those back and also be able to have a decent living at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I feel like across the board, it just needs to be free because, or at least tuition, uh, it should be free because I feel like all of these things are of value. It is more valuable for society to have a better populated uh, people than it is to have, you know, people not be discouraged to go because they can't afford to uh, and stuff like that. But also at the same time, I don't believe everyone should go to college. Uh, you know, trade school, I feel like, should also be free for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, you also mentioned that aspect of it. Um, but yeah, um, uh, I think that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Um, so you're saying, like, are you saying that there would be different tiers, or would it be like a universal healthcare system where it's like, universal yeah. education system basically you like a universal system what would you do system with harvard and princeton yeah. and all the, well, well, the private schools? The, the private institutions can stay private i do believe that the government should do a little bit more to help people be able to afford to go there but i don't think they should um you know fully fund the private institutions so just, the, so private the, institution. Cal, Cal, the state and the university level uh you know like like usually uh States have a like a state college and, and then a university. Uh, and yeah, like, like those. Uh, the, the California system is like the Cal Cal State and then there's the University of California. So those would be yeah. free, which would basically be the government paying the t paying the professors, um, you know, government paying for all that stuff. But which is kind of already the the governments already subsidize or give yeah, but not a lot. Money, like right? a lot of. Kind of like they're get they have a budget that they give the schools the money and then the the schools kind of decide what they do with the money. But also there's a lot of private funding that's involved. Yeah. So I want to make sure that the schools themselves aren't having to have as much private influence from private entities yeah. and are having to worry about you know having funding sort shortages or whatnot yeah definitely um, got to do more for teachers I definitely um yeah. you know if you if you decide you know you're, you got your degree and, and whatever you got it in then you got to go get your teaching credentials i feel like if you go and you get those teaching credentials and then you start working at a at a, at a school that there should be something something up along the lines of forgiving some of your debt or paying off some of your debt uh for college because you're not going to go teach kids and, and, and teach kids how to learn and, and how to feel better about themselves and have self-esteem. And, and that is that those kids who were in your history class may go on and become an engineer, you know, because you, you help them see things in a certain way and, and you, you, you got to a few of them and, and went deeper with some of them than they, that needed that, you know? So I think that we need to encourage people to want to be those people who change kids lives and you know i had some great teachers you know i'm sure you did too so that is something that i'd be for you know so as far as you know using taxpayer money in the education system i'm i'm totally for it to i would say a large extent for somebody who's a republican but the way i look at it is it's just an investment in your workforce i mean we have before this thing hit you know we were at 3.5 percent unemployment but still there was you know, 1.3 million job openings that, that our companies could not find uh, people to fill because they didn't have the yep. expertise. They didn't have the education. So it's like we need people from India. They A lot of those people have it. There are a billion people there. So, you know, they figure out how to get that education. But we would it would be great to, have, you know, have our own people, uh, in, you know, to have those skills and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, pushing mm -hmm. for more people to get into STEM and you know, those kind of fields, get into teaching, you know, and, and incentivize people to do that. I'm, I'm all for that, you know, but there's certain majors where I'm like, nah, you want to do that. That's got to be your, you or your parents' money. <laughs> there's a few majors okay. that feel like that. <laughs> okay. Well, um, okay. And the fourth thing I have here is criminal justice reform and white privilege. Yes. I decided to put these two things together because I feel like they kind of go hand in hand in some ways. Yeah. 
because I remember you you've gotten in trouble on Twitter for saying white privilege doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know what? I so, would not be able to say that unless you know, it, like I, I, my mom's side of the family, Mexican as you can possibly be, came to came to the United States. My grandma, when she was five, her father was worked the the, the fields and and would go back and forth, and then just ended up staying in the United States. And that was a time when big business in America was like, come on over. I mean, there wasn't, there was no fence. There was no wall. There was nothing. We needed people to work. We needed more Americans in general. So it's like, come on over, come on over, come on over. Uh, and, and that happened until that kept going until, you know, a few years ago. It's like, you know, pro- it, it dropped, it's dropped in the early 2000s to se- September 11th, but a good 50 years. It was like, come on in. No problem. Um, a lot of, amnesty being given and stuff you know i think it was the 80s where where it wasn't as reagan think, yeah reagan, it wasn't as like come on he, over but yeah 50s yeah. 60s 70s it was like a free-for-all so yeah. my my grandma and a lot of uh, you know, my grand uncles aunts uh came at that time and and i i've seen them all do and now you know they're three four generations in and they're all they're doing great and they're real Amer- they're americans as american as you could be so and those, those that part of my family does not have white privilege, you know. They they're just, they're Mexicans completely. So, um, I I only say the white privilege thing to to start the discussion. You know, I will easily say that Af- African Americans, you know, when you're taken from uh, your homeland, you know, it's ha- half a million, uh, half a million Af- African Americans that, that were slaves that brought over here. Six million down in in South America. The fi- half a million slaves is what we brought, and and through you know the time and you know that time until now, forty million now are in America now. You know from that half a million, and um, so that you know they there's no base for the for those people to build off of the way that that white people. That were able to come here in the 1500s and 1600s, used slaves, you know, the South more than the North. The North didn't really use slaves at all. But they benefited from it, though. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it, they were definitely stopped using them. They years didn't ago. use them, but they still benefited from them because, yeah, you know, yeah, America's really. America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The South, you know, but, you know, but the, the South the, the used civil, them more, yes. Yeah, the, it's the Civil War was, that people think it's all about. It was all about slavery, but it was really about how the North was treating the South, um, and that the North didn't even want to have slavery and didn't want to have new states because the the slave owners would, you know, get three fifths of a vote from each slave and and be like, you better vote for who we tell you to vote for. You know, if you're it's like if you're someone slave, it's not like you have the freedom to vote what you want. So all. You know, the new slave states would be more more on the side of the South. So, uh, you know, one of the, the breaking points was, you know, one of the, I don't know if it was Kansas or a new state that it was like, should it be slave legal or slave illegal? You know, they were like each new state that joined the union. It was like, OK, legal, illegal, legal, illegal. So it would balance out. And they got they, they were fighting over that. And then, and then the, and then there was trade policy that the South hated. You know that that the, the, they were taxing uh, the type of raw materials that uh, the South makes their money on, and and the North made their money off finished goods and all that kind of, all that stuff. And didn't and the North had more power than the South, so that's why the South, you know, shot at the, the North first. You know, because the South was more pissed at, at the situation than the North. North had more power. And the North ended up winning the, the Civil War, but I, I'm not going to say that uh, African Americans don't have it in general harder than a, a group of people who came here and have been here for hundreds of years and, and and many generations building wealth upon itself and leaving it to the children and so on and so forth. So that there's some privilege in that, but it's like in China, it's Chinese privilege. I mean. America, you know, white people don't have the privilege there. In Nigeria, you know, white people don't have the privilege there. So it's like, who's there and who established that land? Who was there first? I mean, you know, they say the Native Americans, um, you know, my, my thing is land is only yours if you can defend it. If you can't defend it and I take it from you, 
that's the that's the human way it's been that way for thousands of years when one one group of people took over another group of people you got to you've got to make sure that your defense is is adequate to defend your land the native americans didn't do that as well as you know uh, european settlers so and um i'm not going to be like crying about that at this point i think we've treated native americans pretty cr- pretty crappy pretty bad you know and you know, I, we, that's why we said you can do whatever you want on this reservation land that you, that we give you. Um, and it was decided upon whatever was decided upon. These things have been around, you know, for decades and they get to have casinos and make their own laws and whatever. But um, I think African-Americans, you know, they were at a significant disadvantage because they haven't had hundreds of years to build wealth. So I will say that, you know, but also... In the year 2020, um, I know a lot of African Americans who are very successful, and they don't want to be br- drawn into this argument of, uh, you know, my success is like different than your white your success as a white person. You know, I've I've heard plenty of my friends, who are African Americans, who are like I don't want I'm not a part of that. Like I, that's you know I'm doing great. You know, so it's almost like you you know you're taking away, you know. So with their pride, if you if you're gonna say that thing that it's so unequal for them, you know, and they're like, nah, I mean, I'm doing good, you know. But then there are groups of people who are in inner cities, and it's been like bad in those cities for decades, and and that's from policy. I mean, you know, you look at the freeway system in L.A. and like where South Central and how you know it's like boxed in by four freeways, you know. And it was done that way through redlining, through making sure African Americans couldn't live in certain districts or certain areas, and the banks wouldn't loan to them and all that stuff. Even if they were successful, they wouldn't do it. So that kind of those are racist policies, and and I would hope that LA has done everything they can to reverse that stuff, you know. And it, it's just it, a lot of places that have a lot of inequality uh, with African Americans versus the white people, or other. It's very liberal cities that have these problems. You know, Baltimore. So what the deal, guys? You know, it's like it's it's a tough problem to tackle. But I just I just feel like talking about white privilege um, and, 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 and going to white people and saying you should feel bad about yourself. It, even, you know, if you're not going to admit that this is a problem, then, you, you know, you have the you are the problem. And it's never going to get a white person to see the side of somebody who's saying that stuff and a lot of white people are the ones out there screaming at the heart the loudest louder than african-americans in a lot of ways and i don't know what that is is guilt thing or or whatever you may you mom and dad worked too hard and gave you too many opportunities so now you need to feel bad about that i don't like that situation i'm just I, i'm against that so that's why i say white privilege doesn't exist and it's like 1965 the country knew that that the past was bad, that the, there was a lot of racist policies, a lot of segregation and, and, you know, get those people away from me. I don't want them moving my neighborhood stuff, racist stuff. And we passed, we changed the constitution. We, we passed laws to say what we did in the past is wrong. And so that law wise, that was changed. So now from 1965, to 2005, like 2005, I never heard about white privilege. I never, it was like, everybody was getting along, we're all good, we're united against the common enemy in 2003 and four and all that. And then it's like all of a sudden 2014 hits and then like the media all decides we're gonna go after this white privilege thing and the cops are killing uh, African Americans indiscriminately, you know, and push that, push that, and, and it's such a division and it's not, I don't think it's constructive in any way. I think that um, that America has um, acknowledged the things that, it, that the decisions and the laws and the policies that were racist acknowledged that very well in 1965, did w- things that we, uh, what we could do to, to help the poor, uh, poor African-Americans. We have had spent 20, we've spent 23, 24 trillion dollars, probably 25 by now. $25 trillion in the war on poverty. Still got the same what, poverty percentage, um, you know, as, as 1967 when, that, when the war on poverty started. 
And, you know, it's like we, we're doing the best we can to mitigate a, a situation that should never have happened. I mean, there should never have been slaves coming to America. Shouldn't have. And it just, you know, it was a, it's like there were, there were, I don't even think there were slaves in the UK in the 1600s. I think they, they banned slavery in the 1600s, UK. Um, no, they banned yeah. slaves in 1836, I believe. 1836. Oh, so yeah. not even that they had much. Yeah, it was, it was like about 30 years before we did. Oh, that, I thought it was way before. So I guess, you know, everybody was, you know, there was thinking a that, that was okay for a so, long time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think it was okay at all, and I, and I think you know America uh, acknowledged that in the civil rights era, and um, we had a lot of decades that we have tried to build on that, and I think we're light years ahead of where we were in 1965 and 1950. You know, where people should at least not acknowledge that uh, we're a much more accepting culture in in America than than we were 50 years ago. Like that's gay marriage, you know. Right, women's rights, all, all that stuff. It's we're we're better, I think, you know. And I think that our media never talks about how we're better. Just that it's still a problem, and there's still issues, and there's still problems. And then people just get turned off from the whole conversation. When you call someone a racist, and they don't really ever think about that, they, they don't, you know, they got they work with African Americans. Maybe they employ them. Maybe they're employed by them. Uh, and it's they never really thought about that until the media said, oh, it's a problem. We decided it is, and we're gonna use, we're gonna coordinate, and have the same running stories for years, you know. And um, like the the Black Lives Matter and the, that stuff, it seems like it's fallen off the the media radar in the last year. I don't know about what what you think about that, but yeah. So, um, how do I where do I start? Um, so do you think that there isn't a problem with police brutality in reference to black people or do you think that it's over an overblown issue you know i i wonder how much our culture of you know um, movies and tv shows and how a lot of african americans are depicted in in media in general i mean you know it's like uh, the media goes you know goes out of the way to show riots and do this and how it like labels African Americans in a certain way, you know, and I think I wonder if that if that gets into the psyche uh, of, a, of a police officer, white or black, because uh, they, you know, it's like, uh, you know, and that that's training that comes down to training the officers. So you so do think that the, so you do think that that is a problem. You do. Yeah, and, it, okay. and that should be a problem that that cities uh, that cities need to take care of, not the federal government, the cities need to to. Uh, issue guidelines and, and, and do training and, and counter some of that stereotypical stuff and the fear of, of stuff that you've watched in movies and TV and, and counter that and, and get rid of that crap. So um, cities just need to do a better job of policing their own police forces. So I, I think that there's some, definitely some bad apples. And I, I definitely think there's white and black cops who go after uh, African Americans thinking they have a gun or they've got something in their car, and if they don't, you know, there's the you know a lot, a lot of times just a, a law-abiding citizen who who has a gun permit and has every right to have a gun just like you, mm-hmm. just like anyone else, and then they guy get, guy gets shot, you know, because because of somebody's fear of, of a stereotype. So that, okay, okay, that's so that's, that's that's not your your assessment of this is not you know, that bad. I mean, <laughs> you're like, you're, you're not horrible. <laughs> Thanks, um, we, uh, <laughs> no, um, yeah, yeah. We've, we've come a long way when it comes to race and certain things like that, but there are still a lot of problems. Um, I, I don't think that it's a problem to recognize that we have come far, especially, you know, with, 1965 and the Civil Rights Act and all that good stuff and um, whatnot. But at the same time, I do feel like we do need to recognize that we still have plenty of problems today, like within our criminal justice system and within our policing system. Uh, you know, there's more black people it's in prison. Stereotype stuff. There's more Judge, black judges people. do it too. 
Yeah, there's more black people in prison and sometimes getting sentenced longer for the same crimes that white people commit. And, you know, there's still problems. There's, so bi- there's you're not- bias and there's prejudice. Yeah. And that's social. Yeah. And it's like we've done what we can um, so that the government can't, you know, can't redline you and, and make it so you can't uh, get loans for this property versus that property. Like you can sue now. For that, if that if if you can prove that's gone, that's happening to you as an African American, you have recourse because of the laws were changes changed and all that. Whereas it before you couldn't have you couldn't do anything about it. So uh, you know, and and decades of those kind of policies have hurt a lot of African American communities. But I just I do not feel that the way that liberals decide that they that the, they should throw money at the problem the way they do, it just ends up worse. Like in Baltimore. Or you know, there's just a lot of a lot of cities where it's just they're, they're not doing a great job, a great good jobs with it. You know, I think well, LA's, the LA. Well, as good. a socialist, as a socialist, I can agree with you. Liberals don't do a very good job at much of anything. <laughs> <laughs> right on. But, a lot of virtue uh, signaling, you know, a lot of just talk, you know, and and not real good action. Well, yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it, specifically for the liberals, a lot of it is for them. It is just talk. It's not a lot of action. And then the little bit of action that they do do isn't enough, or it's the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, I agree with you on that. Um, so I guess the last thing here is trade deals. Um, so uh, with things like NAFTA and um, uh, our current and or ever-changing system of trade with China, uh, those types of things. So I guess what my real question is, how do you feel about Trump's renegotiated NAFTA? I uh, love it. So um, what? whenever you do a trade deal with a poor country, the risk is that your companies who are in your rich country will want to move to the poor country where labor is cheaper, it's common sense. That's what. That's like the the, the, the path of least resistance. Go and set up a, ch- a shop in Mexico, and now you can make whatever you are selling in America cheaper and make a bigger profit margin. So what the new NAFTA US MCA does is it makes it so uh, Mexican manu- people who are manufacturing in Mexico have to pay their workers very closer to the rate that US in Canada pay their workers. So that's much more advantageous to us as you know, it, it will make it so that companies don't have as much of an incentive to go move to, to move their production to Mexico. And it, we can do tariffs on, on Mexico um, if certain percentages of, of car cars or certain percentages of manufactured goods are not made in the United States. So the percentage of what needs to be made in the United States went up and, and that's, they, that means more jobs in America, more manufacturing jobs in America, that the, the, the wages have to be higher in Mexico, so that will discourage companies going from U.S. to Mexico. So that kind of stuff is just beneficial, more beneficial to the United States than what we had. And that's all I want. It's like I want – I don't want free trade deals where it's just free and it's like, oh, I'm a, I'm a rich country. I'm going to do this free trade deal with you, the poor country. And all the a, a large amount of jobs and, and manufacturing goes to the poor country to utilize their cheap labor. That mm-hmm. needs to go. That that needs to go away. Like the TPP thing that Bernie yeah. hated. That's that's exactly what would happen. That that would just continue to gut our manufacturing base. We had people say manufacturing's gone away, and it's, it's just so stupid to say that. It's like we had 20 million manufacturing jobs at the peak. Now we have about we have close to 13 million. It's not like it all went away. We yeah. still have 13 out of the 20 still there, and we don't want to lose any more than that. We want to gain. We're gonna to go to. We want to go to 15 million manufacturing jobs because for every manufacturing job, you have uh, more. Uh, you know, uh, auto mechanics. You have more food restaurant stuff. You have more entertainment. You have. You just have more jobs that that are made because of that manufacturing job. So it's like it's it's manufacturing jobs are just more lucrative than any other type of job. Uh, when, when you're accounting for, for, you know, it's like if you bring in a, a big manufacturing plant into like somewhere in Oklahoma City, you, then you're going to see a whole bunch of uh, shops prop, uh, 
you know, get come in there, you know, like a new restaurants, like I said, you know, entertainment, movie theaters, you know, Walmarts, all that stuff's going to come in because you just bought in a big manufacturing plant. So that that's what we want. We want more manufacturing jobs and people who are saying that we're just a service economy. economy and we're finding out right now why it's so stupid for us to uh, put all our eggs in China's basket and say, you guys make us make everything for us. All yeah. our pharmaceuticals, all our equipment for this and that. We need to start making a lot of this stuff ourselves, if only for national security, if only to make sure that we have those items and that we have access to those items. And so um, this virus really is accelerating this decoupling from China and and the, it's really accelerating this America first, let's manufacture in America, that, that whole thing. It's really, it's do, it's pushing that far faster. So it, the case has definitely been made that we, we had shortages on a bunch of stuff and China could just say, well, we're not going to manufacture generic uh, prescriptions anymore. People, you know, wouldn't have access to that kind of stuff. Prices would go through the roof. We got to start doing manufacturing that more of that here in the, in the United States. You know, pharmaceuticals, cars, whatever you you name it. And so, and that's what that's like. We may have to pay a little more for certain things, you know, just like that fifteen dollar minimum wage argument. But in the end, more people will have money, then more people will have jobs. And so mm-hmm. it's better to have a job uh, making a certain amount of money and have to pay a little more for, for stuff than to have no job because then you can't afford anything. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I don't I don't disagree with much of anything you just said. My only problem with the new NAFTA is there's no environmental protections yeah. in it. That's pretty much my only real critique of it. Outside of that, um, it's better than the original NAFTA. Um, so, yeah. So, like I, I said... I, for, I, yeah. I just want Trump to do the, 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 another four years just so we can we can really get a great trade deal with China. <laughs> oh. We got the phase one. We, get, we, need, we need phase two and three. And uh, those are going to be real, real important. And to, and to make sure that we don't go halfway on this and then turn back. So I, I would I would hate for that. I would hate for Biden to come in there and just give it all, give all those gains back to China. And, and I know that they, and he's a globalist. The guys behind him are globalists. You know, they're all about uh, trying to put all the world's power into the UN's hand and, and be able to do carbon tax credits to, uh, you know, basically say to some countries that are just getting started, hey, you guys can't. Uh, do what we used to do 50 years ago or we used to do 20 years ago because you're because that's bad and, and and you know we're we're gonna tell you what to do and we're gonna if you anything you use uh, fossil fuels to make your products whatever we're gonna tarp that that's the EU says all that and it's just ridiculous you know so I, I'm just not into that kind of stuff but um, you know like I, all I'm looking for is improvements and improvements is better than nothing. So mm-hmm. that's so, what I'm seeing with this trade deal stuff. So last thing that I'm curious about, who do you usually watch for news? Who are your favorite go-to news people? I um, I go to zerohedge.com. So zerohedge.com. Um, it's a, kind of a news aggregator. So um, they have articles from all over the place, but mostly independent, independent blogs. You know, a lot of my economic stuff I get from there. Uh, a lot of lot this they have a lot of stuff you know doom a lot of doomsday stuff too like you know cro- this is gonna we're all gonna crash and everything's gonna be be over and blah blah, blah. So, some of that stuff's a little ridiculous but I don't I only watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox News to see what the richest people in the world are trying to engineer as a narrative <laughs> that's the only reason I watch mainstream news because. I want to see what their plans are. What are, they, what are they trying to get us to believe? Because why would you believe uh, big media companies that are owned by the largest multinational corporations in the world? Same people. Why would you listen to those people? If, you, if you're if you against the, you know, the 0.01% having everything, then don't believe their media. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> so Zero Hedge. And then there's this uh, other site I really like called the conservativetreehouse.com. I think he should change the name. Like it's his his last refuge on on Twitter, uh, the last refuge. Um, but he he really broke down all the FISA, the fraudulent FISA stuff that the, the FBI did with Carter Page and and, 
and the, the 17 errors and omissions and all the stuff they're trying to cover up and you know basically you just just you know they knew that dossier was fake uh, they went and, uh, they went and uh, interviewed Christopher Steele's primary subsource this guy you know in wherever the hell Christopher Steele is the guy who supposedly authored that dossier and that guy who said oh, everything I said was all innuendo and and you know we're drinking and and talking shit and and um, you know the guy took that as fact and put it in the dossier and then and then you had Fusion GPS feeding that dossier more stuff they just they they just had the Christopher Steele guy put a stamp on it so it looked, it looked like a secret British spy who was getting all this information on Trump or Trump's campaign people but the way that they use that the FISA stuff they he really breaks it all down and, and from you know um, from like mid 2015 to like mid 2016 there was like you know, 90 percent of the FISA searches were illegal and didn't have warrants, and and they they just had a lot of information on people, and they didn't they haven't even prosecuted anyone using those FISA things. It's like they used it to do media leaks, and I mean this FISA stuff, the, the search queries, you can all you need is a cell phone number, mm -hmm. type in that cell phone number. And, and then, and then you type in a keyword and then everything, every single text, every, every, every little piece of information that has that word pops up for you for emails, you put in the email, you put in a keyword and then every, it's like completely people they, like they, when they get this, they use this, they don't even get the words. They just go in there and they were letting uh, independent contractors use this information on Americans, complete violation of the fourth amendment i think it is um, so are you, okay here's something we might also agree with the yeah. nsa and the patriot act are you against that totally uh, you know if you want to get a warrant go yeah. three the, the tier three judge and just like anyone else gets a damn warrant there's yeah. no reason why you need to go and do this secret court where the the person you're trying to get a warrant on does not have a say it, yeah. if this should never be used on americans yeah. For people, for terrorists and people outside of our country that are, you know, using our, our internet system, whatever, that's fine. That's what it was used for. But they start, they started using it on Americans, and so mm -hmm. we need to, we need to cut that. So, you know, but all right, too many and, politicians uh, are not into and yeah, you, Trapped is about to have a new album come out soon. Yeah, yeah, we have a new record. It's called Shadow Work. A little Carl Young reference there. Um, yeah, like the last few years, I've just really gotten into the, the Carl Jung stuff and the, just to kind of admit that you've got a dark side and, and keep that side close to you and know that side of you so you can control it and use it for your benefit instead of, instead of um, you know, refusing to believe that you have, you know, parts of you that are dark or parts of you that, um, you know, that you're not really attending to, you know, the anger parts of you, the the vengeful parts of you, you know, you gotta, you gotta admit that we're, we've got two sides to us and there's a good and there's a bad and there's, a, there's a light and there's a dark. And, uh, that's a, a lot of the theme on, uh, of the songs on this record. So we're, we're okay, when's it going to be, it when's it going to be coming out? Uh, we're going to have two songs come out next month. Um, and our, on the pre, on our pre-order, and then we're going to release a single a month until August when we drop the whole thing. And hopefully we can be, we're, we're touring by, you know, August, September, at least, you know, hopefully. Hopefully. You know? Hopefully. Um, yeah, well, well, that's all I got here. Good, um, I'll Thanks let you know me. whenever I upload it. Um, hopefully after this, people will not think you're as crazy and wild as your tweets are. <laughs> and hopefully people will uh, listen to some more traps because... Goodbye. Everyone always brings up uh, Headstrong, and I'm like, they have other hits. I mean, not hit songs as big as yeah. Headstrong, but Headstrong's you know, you guys have other the monster. <laughs> you guys have other you guys have other rock hits that uh, I enjoy listening to, and uh, yeah. And if uh, um, let me know, like, if you guys are coming to Oklahoma City uh, on your next tour, I would try to see y'all. Yeah, man. We'll so try hopefully, to guess this, man. Hopefully, we can connect whenever you're here. Would love to, bro. Hell yeah. All right. All right. Take All care, right. man. Thanks. Peace. Bye. Later.